In this reflection, I'm returning to Leslie Stevenson and David Haberman's book, Ten Theories of Human Nature, to look at the concluding chapter on Darwin and Darwinism. Let's look at what these two authors have to say. Our authors ask if uh, it might be a good idea to look to the methods of science to see if we can find out the truth about human nature. They acknowledge that this thought uh, was already inspired by those in the 17th and 18th century, and they make reference to Hobbes and Humes and members of the French Enlightenment. They acknowledge that now in the 21st century, almost everyone has come to accept the notion that humans are descended from primitive creatures, and thanks to Darwin's 19th century theory of evolution by natural selection. And they note that in recent decades, the uh, science of evolutionary psychology has been widely touted as the source of new insights into human nature. Darwinians in the 20th century uh, questioned whether the process of species change by evolution was necessarily progressive. Um, the word evolution often carries a connotation of progress, but uh, certainly not in every context. Natural selection, is important to note, does not logically imply that the later forms of life are better as judged by any sort of human criteria, only that they are better adapted to the relevant set of environmental conditions. The point is that a species does not have to be ideally adapted to its ecological niche, only adapted well enough to survive and to reproduce. Stevenson and Hemmerman tell us of others who have attempted to explain human nature using science. Now, as part of this historical perspective, they introduce us first to Sigmund Freud, who attempted to develop uh, a theory of human nature in postulating innate drives that were rooted in the needs to feed and to reproduce. And he speculated about how our primitive ancestors may have contributed to our present human psychology. But at crucial points, Freud gave a Lamarckian rather than Darwinian account of mental evolution. Our authors note that in the late 19th century, both uh, psychology and sociology emerged as domains of scientific study independent of other areas of human interest, which would include human anatomy and physiology and evolutionary biology. Wilhelm Wundt wrote about the prospect of collective psychology, a more embracing or inclusive psychology from a cultural and anthropological point of view. But to Emile Durkheim, the psychological facts were irreducible to biological facts. The upshot is that since the end of the 19th century, then, there has been a threefold division between the biological sciences, psychology, and the social sciences, and the boundaries or borderlines between these three different disciplines have been continuously contested. Our authors tell us that Emil Durkheim was an evolutionary theorist, but only in the most general sense. He saw an analogy between the evolution of species and the social trend toward increasing division of labor, and hence uh, talked about the differentiation of species of economic and social roles. But he was under no illusion that this was a process of Darwinian natural selection. He held that behavior is subject to distinctively sociological laws. Moving along, our authors tell us that B.F. Skinner accepted Darwin's theory of evolution, but he liked to draw an analogy between his own theory of behavioral conditioning and natural selection, saying that the environment, that is the native environment, or the sociological environment, or the laboratory environment, selects or shapes behavior by rewarding some behaviors and punishing others. He firmly rejected all attempts 
to explain animal behavior in terms of mental states, since these were unobservable. Skinner considered mental states to be scientifically untestable. Skinner assumed that all animal behavior can be explained then in terms of environmental variables, and he tended to assume then that there were no significant innate differences between individuals within a species, so heredity played no considerable part in psychological behavior from Skinner's perspective. Of course, today we understand that human behavior actually depends on innate factors as well as environmental impact. And the authors of our book credit Nico Tinberg and Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Fritsch for making us aware of this. These were pioneers of animal behavior or ethology in the 20th century. These three ethologists realized that some patterns of animal behavior, those we describe as instinctive, could not be explained by a behaviorist psychology, and that such behaviors seem to be innate or fixed in a way that they cannot be eliminated or significantly modified, however much the environment is varied. Our authors tell us that in the middle 1970s, Edward O. Wilson extended the findings of the ethologist who found a whole new scientific discipline which applied rigorous methods of population biology and genetics to complex social systems. Wilson was building upon his earlier studies with insect societies. In this book, Sociology and New Synthesis, Wilson argued that the humanities and social sciences might benefit from an epistemology that was anchored in a biological or evolutionary paradigm, a view which those outside of the sciences labeled scientific imperialism. In the subsequent book, one titled On Human Nature, Wilson proposed to show in more detailed form how the evolutionary biology of humans could explain topics previously reserved for just the social sciences or for philosophy. Although he is careful to acknowledge in this book that this is not a work of science, but a work about science. Wilson argues that the human mind is a device for survival and reproduction, and reason is just one of its various techniques, and beliefs are really enabling systems for survival. Wilson's program on sociobiology immediately generated heated controversy in which three main strands can be distinguished, according to Stevenson and Haberman. The first of these three strands was the scientific strand. Some, like Richard Lewontin, believed that Wilson's program for applying sociobiology to humans was just not good science. Lewontin wanted causal laws and not statistical arguments. The second strand, then, was a departmental strand. Academics in the social sciences and humanities interpreted Wilson's proposal as imperialist. Wilson's plan actually threatened the standard social science model, which held that with respect to human beings, culture completely transcends biology. That is, human nature was basically a blank slate to be written on by society. The last strand was the moral or political strand. If nature is admitted to be more intentional than nurture in forming human individuals and societies, that it seems there would be much less possibility of improving individuals and society through mechanisms of education, social programs, and political change. Some moralists and politicians were concerned that Wilson's proposal implied that if the differences between individuals and races and sexes were innate to a large
large degree, then there was no point in trying to reduce or eliminate these differences. And sociologists and anti-racists and feminists were aghast by Wilson's proposal. Stevenson and Hammerman tell us that not surprisingly in the left-wing climate of the 1970s and 80s, sociobiology became a dirty word. But they note that today Wilson's proposal survives in the form of evolutionary psychology rather than sociobiology, thanks to Lita Cosmides and John Tooby, who argue that the standard social science model, which has increasingly ignored the existing evidence for uh, any sort of innate or evolutionary produced cognitive mechanisms in the human mind should be replaced by what they call the integrated causal model. The integrated causal model proposes that behind any human behavior there will be a complicated set of chains of causation. These chains of causation will include the contributions of natural selection, of course, which has operated on our ancestors for many millennia. It will also include the historical development of a variety of human cultures, uh, which have been around, of course, for many, many centuries. This will also include the mixing of genes and sexual reproduction, which gives each and every one of us his or her unique set of genes. The fourth would include the input of the physical and sociocultural environment, which has an impact upon the body and mental development of each individual. And finally, an acknowledgement of the information processing systems involved in perception and speech recognition. So the upshot is, is that Tubi and Cosmides picture a seamless matrix of causal explanation that includes an awareness that every feature of every phenotype is fully and equally co-determined by the interaction of an organism's genes and its ontogenetic environments, meaning that everything impinges upon it. The interaction of these two, that is the genes and the environment in which the genes are working, is always part of any complete explanation of human behavior or human phenomenon. Tubi and Cosmides say that to reject the picture of a seamless web of causation is to embrace one or another set of dualisms that lack intellectual warrant.